annual Early Career Scientist Symposium. Uh, my name is Tim James, and on behalf of the committee, um, we're really excited about uh, the program that we have today. And I'm just going to start with a couple uh, simple announcements. Um, we have uh, a, a box at the, at the front of the room for any questions that come to your mind and you might not um, have time to ask them. And um, we also have this poster session and lunch, which is going to be held in the third floor of the, the atrium where you came in um, on the other side of the building. And then another little thing is if you want to sort of go, come in and out discreetly, you can go up the back stairs. And that'll, if you go straight through, that'll put you in the second floor of the atrium, OK? Um, right, so uh, yes, so just to start with a few acknowledgments, um, I really want to thank the rest of the committee, Chelsea Wood, Kevin Theis, Marion Schmidt, and Thomas Jenkinson. And also a special thanks to Cindy Carl, who did most of the logistics, as well as Gail Kuhnlein. So a big thanks to them. And, um, and also to thank the sponsors of this, um, of this symposium. It, it's really mostly through the, um, the graces of the late Dr. Nancy Walls that we're able to have this symposium. So um, uh, it's really, it's really um, her idea to, to fund this thing. And also thanks to Tom Schmidt, who helped provide money from the Michigan Microbiome Initiative as well. So, um, the idea behind the symposium, and we've had this now 11 times, is to, is to basically um, showcase a, a very emerging topic in ecology and evolutionary biology, and then, of course, bring in some of the, um, the rising stars, as well as a, a keynote speaker or two. And, um, and so this year's uh, topic was, was proposed uh, initially by Chelsea Wood, and, um, and so it was, it was a very timely thing. And, and it, it's pretty clear now that microbiome research is, is taking off. And I, I'm not going to say very much more, because if you know anything about what I do, it, it is not microbiome research. So I'm going to keep it very short. Um, but it was interesting in thinking about this topic, um, because uh, a number, I think, of, of microbial ecologists or some of the people right in the center of this topic, um, when they think of the term microbiome, actually have a slightly different concept as some of the other folks. And it's sort of a dichotomy between sort of the medical side and the, um, the microbial ecology side. So some, some people think that the microbiome actually is more like um, the microbial biome, so in the sense of like all of the uh, microbial organisms in an environment, but the topic in, in this case is actually the microbes that live inside of a host. And, and so just um, going back, so if you'd look to see who, who actually coined this term, supposedly it's Joshua Leidenberg, who um, is claimed to fame as bacterial transformation and transduction. Um, but back in the omics craze, uh, he, he coined this term apparently to, you know, to signify the ecological community of commensals, symbiotic, and pathogenic microorganisms that literally share our body space and have largely been ignored in terms of, of their impact on health and disease. So this was a very human-centered perspective on, on the field. And so what is pretty obvious um, from, from the topic of this symposium is that we're no longer taking such a human-centered perspective and it's no longer just about the health. We are integrating these, these major disciplines. And so um, we are also, I think, very excitingly getting to showcase how this concept of a microbiome and how it's been overlooked is readily applicable to pretty much any multicellular organism. And so whether it be um, uh, monkeys or even fungi, it's clear that they have organisms that grow on and in them that have largely been overlooked in terms of the organism's fitness, ecological function, and et cetera. And so um, 
And so then I'm going to just let those, those people tell you their story. And, um, and I'm excited to, to turn this over to um, Kevin, to, who will introduce the first speaker. have for our first keynote presentation today, Seth Bordenstein. Seth did his undergraduate and his graduate work at the University of Rochester in central New York. And he did postdoc work at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole. And he's now an associate professor at Vanderbilt University. And Seth's at the forefront of developing and testing models of microbial, postmicrobial coevolution. And he's one of the few to actually take those models to their logical conclusion and evaluate the roles of microbes in host speciation events. So we're very pleased to have him here today. He did lose his voice yesterday, but he's here and he's powering through and we appreciate it. Thanks. The operative word here, so I will lower expectations for what's gonna happen. Um, but thank you very much for the invitation to be here. This is an exciting time uh, for me to hear about all the great science that we're going to hear about later today. Um, and I'll just get right into this before I lose the rest of my voice. So, uh, Darwin uh, publishes The Origin of Species in 1859. And many biologists in the evolutionary community like to note that The Origin of Species really could have been titled The Origin of Adaptations. And the reason for that is that Darwin although he had one chapter on hybridization, uh, didn't necessarily lay the foundation for studying the origin of species. What he reasoned was is that natural selection uh, derives variation, and those varieties are iterative and continuous and gradual over time. So the idea that varieties would split into species is almost anti-evolution. Why would evolution produce a trait that you can't no longer interbreed? Um, so Darwin arguably leaves the species problem um, and all its great patterns and rules to the future of biology. And he calls it the mystery of mysteries largely for that reason. So I'm gonna give you a, an altered history of speciation as, as I look at it from a microbial lens. Um, and this can be dated back to 1927 where Professor Ivan Wallen at the University of Colorado um, is working on mitochondria. And in his book, uh, Symbionticism in the Origin of Species, he writes, it is a rather startling proposal that bacteria, the organisms which are associated with disease, may represent the fundamental causative factor in the origin of species. <clears throat> now, are we going to go that far today? Uh, definitely not. But I do think that Wallen is a very interesting character in the history of evolutionary biology because for the first time he reasons that mitochondria are in fact bacterial derived. More so, he actually claims that mitochondria are bacteria. So this is way before Lynn Margulis actually uh, gets, to, gets to her conclusion, right? So how did Wallen do that? Well, he simply looked inside the cells of animals and plants and saw that mitochondria divide by binary fission. And this is only attributable to bacteria. Because all animals and plants have mitochondria, he had this epiphany, if you will, almost too speculative, but it was uh, an epiphany that perhaps these bacteria, these intracellular bacteria, represent a fundamental factor in Darwin's great uh, origin of species problem. <clears throat> so what happens to Wallen? Why don't many of us know about him? Well, it turns out in the same year that he publishes his book, H.J. Muller publishes his famous Drosophila x-radiation studies um, and shows that transmutability of organisms, or Drosophila, uh, can be mapped to nuclear chromosomes, right? So the foundation for the modern synthesis is commencing now, where Darwin's focus on evolution and natural selection, mainly in animals and plants, now seamlessly fits together with the observation that nuclear genetics can explain the, the, how varieties form. Um, and these are mappable not necessarily to bacteria, as Wallen might claim, but to the nuclear genome. So, Another interesting aspect is 
this book. In 1937, so just 10 years later, Theodosius Stavzansky really brings together uh, the modern synthesis in Darwin's problem into this very famous book that most of us probably know. <clears throat> what I like to note is that uh, Dobzhansky's book title is just like Wallen's book title, right? He probably looked over to Wallen and said, I'm going to swap out symbionticism with genetics. And now I've, he sets the foundation for the origin of species in terms of the biological species concept. He gives us dobzhansky muller incompatibilities. And the nuclear-centric foundation for biology is now off and running at this point. The other problem is that Wallen claimed he could culture mitochondria from rabbit livers. So he had this one big problem in his history where clearly that was due to contamination. And I think I've got to give him some credit. He was concerned about contamination at the time, um, but probably didn't have the tools to recognize how important contamination can be. So I think what I'd like to suggest to you is that the early um, errors of biology were largely missing microbiology. Right? We have Darwin focusing on animals and plants, so it's a eukaryocentric era. We have the modern synthesis being a nucleocentric era. And even leading some folks like T.H. Morgan to say that, you know what, whatever Wallen was observing in the cytoplasm, that can be ignored genetically. We need not worry about that. Um, so the history of microbiology is largely divorced from the history of botany and zoology. And if anything's sort of teaching us today, it's that I think we're largely seeing a merger of these three different big fields um, in the context of host-associated microbiomes, which is why it's so exciting to be here today. <clears throat> so here's Margulis, who gives us uh, the, the formal uh, foundation for mitochondria being bacterial-derived. Uh, here's Carl Woese giving us the tree of life, opening our eyes to the great depth of microbial diversity. And then finally, in the last 10 years, we're experiencing with technology driving it um, a new synthesis, if you will, maybe a postmodern synthesis, as Eugene Koonin states or Margaret McFall McGuire likes to say, because we're integrating microbes into all facets of biology. One area where we haven't done a good job, at least in, in my uh, opinion, is that the origin of species still remains a difficult area to get microbial thinking into. Um, and in fact, this is. A, a typical summary of a review from the speciation field where very often the field is focusing on speciation genes in the nucleus. So what are the types of genes that cause reproductive isolation and what are the phenotypes that cause reproductive isolation? <clears throat> it's very rare that you'll see a review that considers microbes in this kind of discussion. And I think it's gotten to such a polarizing extent that even as far as in 2013, we have a few prominent biologists um, in developmental biology and evolutionary biology, uh, you know, saying things that I was sort of surprised by because I don't necessarily agree with them, which is I know of very, very few cases in which endosymbionts cause speciation and a ton of cases in which changes in host genes do and in which those genes have been mapped. <clears throat> Second, I don't think we have any evidence yet that there has been speciation caused by microbes. I'm not willing to go that far yet. So some of you may say, well, speciation by microbes or symbiosis is obvious. Some of you may not. But there's clearly a portion of evolutionary geneticists who aren't looking at the microbiological role uh, to be played in this area. So I want to start the discussion then with what is a species actually made of? And clearly, it's made of a nuclear genome. And that nuclear genome is not necessarily a harmonious unit of organization that's vertically transmitted. And I'd like to, you to note that because I'm going to compare it to the microbiome in just a second. So the nuclear genome is populated by autosomes, but it's populated by sex chromosomes that have different transmission routes and all sorts of selfish genetic elements. Yes, it's vertically transmitted, but it also undergoes recombination. So genes are shuffling all the time. Gene-gene epistasis has to deal with the fact that genes are being shuffled all the time. Some of these uh, traits relate to the microbiome. So the, if a species microbiome is going to be made intrinsic to, you, to the species, what is it and how does it compare to the nuclear genome? Well, it's going to exist of all the microbes, of course. Um, and I think one area of contention for the microbiome is, is it vertically transmitted? And I probably we need to delve much deeper into this area, but generally we think of the host-associated microbiome as being acquired from the environment. 
And if it's acquired from the environment, this somehow creates a problem for setting up associations between microbes and hosts that evolution or selection could operate on. But that, that problem, that intellectual problem that I think we don't know a lot about, is theoretically continuous to the problem of recombination and gene shuffling shaping adaptations. So there's no intrinsic reason to separate the microbiome away from fundamentals of evolutionary genetics because there are parallel issues here. And I'd like you to just consider that, that for the rest of this talk. <clears throat> there is evidence, rising evidence, for vertical transmission or at least maternal microbial transmission uh, in the animal world. I'm not going to go through all the details here, but I'd like to say that there is external transmission. Uh, in humans, for example, the mother's breast milk has up to 600 OTUs. That would be a case of uh, transmission to the offspring after birth, vaginal microbes as well. Internal transmission is a more provocative area when we get outside of invertebrates. Mammals, we tend not to think, have a lot of internal maternal transmission. I, I'm, the way I see the evidence right now is we have a lot of disparate pieces of evidence that would suggest this is not true, that probably there is some degree of small uh, internal transmission. And at least in the human case, we're seeing evidence, although it's uh, somewhat controversial for a placental microbiome, um, we're also seeing evidence for bacteria and all sorts of um, tissues that would suggest there could be internal transmission. And then finally, there are experimental studies in mice. So in 2008, Jimenez et al. showed that you could orally inoculate pregnant mice with a probiotic, and that, that oral probiotic would, in fact, make it to the fetus. Uh, and they could culture it from the fetus. So uh, let's, I think, keep an open mind that sterile womb paradigm, although it's 100 years old, is really a paradigm that stems from the dogma of the germ theory of disease and that we should be afraid of microbes. But everything in recent history suggests that perhaps there's beneficial microbes in all aspects of biology, including uh, the sterile womb or inside the womb. Insects are canonical cases for uh, vertical transmission. So these are just some preeminent systems. Buchnera symbionts, Wigglesworthia symbionts. Um, all these types of insects experience some form of maternal microbial transmission, and its fidelity is quite strong. Um, so there's really no problem there. And then I think we're starting to see cases that are unusual for vertical transmission. Sponges uh, have a vertically transmitted microbiota. And then even in some vertebrates, we're seeing uh, mostly pathogenic organisms, at least we think pathogenic organisms occupy the, the eggs or the yolk of the eggs in some of these vertebrate systems, as well as in the eggs of the fish. <clears throat> and then even without internal transmission, it's possible that you can get a form of vertical inheritance, but it's, it's a social form of vertical inheritance, social transmission. So for example, there's co-inheritance of H. pylori stomach bacteria in humans. This has been shown a couple times now first by Felucidal in 2003, but we put together a phylogeny that shows uh, what Felucia claimed, but they'd never done the phylogenetic analysis, which is that the diversity of H. pylori over time parallels the migration routes of uh, H. pylori from out of Africa and beyond. Um, so there is potential for even non-internally transmitted uh, microbes to establish some host microbe fidelity or interaction. So when we get to the question of what makes a new species, <clears throat> it's worthy of approaching it from the attention of both the genome and the microbiome. So in this simplistic model, the organism now has both. Um, we'll have a last common ancestor. And over some period of time, there's separation by a geographic barrier or some other isolation barrier that creates divergence in these populations. And ultimately, speciation is complete when these two sets of organisms or species can no longer interbreed. But note there's been divergence now in the microbiome and in their genome. And so the central hypothesis going forward is the microbiome may not be the fundamental causative factor in the origin of species, but it at least may be as important as the nuclear genome in the origin of species. So what's the evidence for that? Well, we've got to have ways of uh, using reductionist approaches to, to uh, answer this question. So thank you for the laughter. It's a subtle joke. But <clears throat> so 
One of the ways we're doing it is asking why do hybrids die when closely related species interbreed? And there's three reasons, although we don't often talk about them in evolutionary biology. The first is this the standard dobzhansky muller hybrid incompatibilities, where divergence in alleles in genome one and alleles in genome two create hybrid problems such as sterility or viability because those divergent alleles no longer work together. The second reason is you could have divergence in the microbiome separate from the genome. In fact, completely independent of the genome, you could have divergence in microbes that cause hybrid inviability or sterility. And I'll tell you an example of that. And finally, if you put this all together, it may take two to tango in which the genome and the microbiome interactions are so fundamental that you create a model of what's called hologenomic speciation, where you have to consider both the genome and the microbiome in the origin of species. So we've been studying this, uh, these phenomena in Nasonia. This is, uh, this is Nasonia. It's not this colorful, and it's not this big. But <laughs> it is called the jewel wasp, uh, affectionately, because it's metallic and shiny. Um, and we've been using it because it's an excellent model system for studying the origin of species in closely related species pairs. So if you were to go to Drosophila and use Melanogaster, its closest related species is three to five million years old. In Nasonia, we have three to four species that all diverged in the last million years. Um, the older species pair, and then two, then two that form a younger species pair as well. <clears throat> so you're looking at mating behavior as I talk you through some of the biology of Nasonia here. Okay, so the male's on top of the female trying to um, spit pheromones at her sweep his antenna, nod his heads, and is looking for her to, to acknowledge that this is a homo-specific mate. And uh, once she does that, she lowers her antenna down, she opens up her abdomen, and the male will get the signal from her uh, mother's antenna and back up and inseminate her. <clears throat> As I mentioned, uh, Nasonia is a pretty cool model for speciation. We also have genetic tools. So um, we have full genome sequences for all species. We have thousands of molecular markers to do QTL analyses. We have RNAi technology for knockdown. We now have germ-free rearing, and they're very easily maintained. Okay. So the species distribution, also noteworthy. Uh, Vitropenis, which will be a cornerstone of the topic today, exists uh, throughout North America. And then Longicornis and Geralti, another piece of the puzzle today, exists sympatrically within Nasonia vitropenis's range. Geralti on the east coast, Longicornis on the west coast. All right, the first story I'd like to tell you about is actually a microbe-microbe incompatibility. And this is going to be with Wolbachia. So Wolbachia are one of the most common vertically transmitted symbionts in the animal world. Um, this is a Nasonia egg. Uh, in blue are the mitotically dividing chromosomes. And in green are the Wolbachia stained, and they localize towards the posterior end of the embryo, which is pretty interesting because this end of the embryo is where the pole cells and ultimately the testes and ovaries are fated to develop from. And because Wolbachia is vertically transmitted, they have specialized, even as early in development, to find their way into the, essentially the cells that will transmit them to the next generation. So at least 40% of all arthropod species have Wolbachia in vertical transmission. So this is now Wolbachia in uh, the testes of Nasonia in the accessory glands. They're labeled red here in this case. <clears throat> and then this is a transmission electron micrograph of Wolbachia. It's about one micron in size. Uh, it's not terribly interesting to look at. Uh, but what is interesting is sometimes we see bacteriophage particles being produced because Wolbachia harbors a temperate phage whoa that is both uh, lysogenic and lytic. And in this case, we were able to see a lytic production of these phage particles. So that's really another story that we work on. I'm not going to focus on that today. One of the most common mechanisms that Wolbachia cause is a form of reproductive isolation um, on the host side. But on their side, we call it cytoplasmic incompatibility. And this is a way for Wolbachia to genetically drive itself through host populations with efficiency. So under, this, uh, under these mechanics for a one-way crossing incompatibility, infected males mated to uninfected females are incompatible, no offspring are produced. 
but all other crosses are compatible. So first of all, I'd like to say, why are Wolbachia causing this incompatibility? And the reason is because Wolbachia are maternally transmitted from one generation to the next. So if Wolbachia is causing the uninfected females to have reduced fitness, then infected females have a relative fitness advantage because they reproduce twice as much as the uninfected females. And that's why Wolbachia causes this essentially suicidal phenotype, at least on the male side, because Wolbachia are using the males as suicide males to decrease the fitness of uninfected females. And this, in turn, allows Wolbachia to spread every generation. This phenomenon spreads Wolbachia because it enhances maternal, uh, the maternal infected mother's fitness because they're reproducing more. So why, how do Wolbachia cause this problem? Um, this is pretty fascinating, and we don't have a full solution on how it's doing it yet, but after fertilization in this cross, the paternal genome and the maternal genome line up for the first mitosis, and they both have to undergo condensation to get through mitosis, but in pro-metaphase, we can see something different. The paternal chromatin don't condense, whereas the maternal chromatin do. This persists through metaphase, and ultimately, at telophase, the maternal chromatin are splitting, but the pater I'm sorry, the, yeah, the maternal chromatin are splitting properly. The paternal chromatin is just shredded because it never lined up for the cell cycle to go through properly. So this embryo clearly is not going to make it, and that's why we see the inviability here. It is also, this mechanism is rescued by infected females because you'll note, although you have an infected male here, infected females rescue that trait, and we don't know the molecular basis of either of these components just yet. <clears throat> okay, so importantly, this modification in rescue component leads to bidirectional CI, which is a two-way incompatibility now. If there's divergence in the modification and rescue systems, because you have different genetic strains of Wolbachia, these can each encode their own modification and their own rescue component and leads to reciprocal incompatibility between Wolbachia strains. But of course, they rescue themselves because the encryption method is meant to do that. It's strain specific. Now, the model here is if there's no genetic divergence in two populations, but only Wolbachia divergence, you could essentially have a speciation event just by microbial infections. And here it is. So let's consider a last common ancestor of uninfected Nisonia. Two, uh, two populations diverge or just split, and the only thing that changes them is their acquisition of new Wolbachia infections, which then spread by unidirectional C high. And if these ever made secondary contact in a hybrid zone or in the lab as we do it, we could potentially see the induction of speciation strictly by bidirectional CI, and no genetic divergence is required. Um, so is there evidence for this? Well, the best case the, that we have so far is, is within Nisonia. And these crosses essentially illuminate that. Here's uh, the older species pair, and the interspecific crosses are shown in the middle, and the younger species pair. When these species are Wolbachia infected, the hybrid production is completely uh, obliterated in the older species pair and is severely limited in the younger species pair. And we were able to show that by antibiotically curing the Wolbachia, um, having uninfected hosts rescues the inviability caused by Wolbachia quite dramatically and sometimes even more significantly than in the offspring production of the parentals. So the bottom line here is that Wolbachia is a powerful agent of reproductive isolation in the F1 generation and can affect both older species pairs and younger species pairs. There's a little bit more significance for finding it in the younger species pair. And the reason is because if you look at genetic divergence and its correlation to isolation, with one being complete, complete isolation, there's going to be some positive correlation over time. The older species pair has a different amount of reproductive isolation than the younger species pair does. So when Wolbachia comes into the younger species pair, it could potentially push the speciation event to completion without additional genetic divergence, or actually without any genetic divergence in theory. Whereas in the older species pair, we're stuck with this problem of there's other isolation barriers there. And because there's other isolation barriers there, 
we can't say whether Wolbachia could be causal to the speciation event because there's all these other isolation barriers. All right. Is this the only story for Wolbachia? No. Um, so John Janicki's lab has done some great work in the field on mushroom feeding Drosophila and has shown that species of subquinaria and recens uh, meet in a hybrid zone and cytoplasmic incompatibility in one way coupled with sexual isolation in the other way plus hybrid male sterility brings down gene flow to a pretty low level between these two species. And this is not just the only other case of Wolbachian speciation. So it appears that Wolbachia are, yes, common in arthropods, B, have the ability to drive reproductive isolation events sometimes rapidly. Um, and this has left, uh, I think, this has been left largely an interesting phenomena. We don't necessarily know how common it is yet. But the critics would say, well, this is just one microbe and only in arthropods. So it's not a universal mechanism for driving the origin of species, as if there would be a universal mechanism, right? Probably not. There are many different ways to make a species. So that actually motivated us to go to the gut microbiome as a more general proxy for studying speciation by symbiosis. And the reason is because you know insects, yes, are one of the most diverse groups of animals um, and species groups on the planet, but they're not the only ones. And most other organisms, ha animals, have some form of a gut, whether you're a sponge or a hydra or a complex organism like a human. So we reason that we could move into this area and see if this is a more general phenomenon outside of the one Wolbachia case. <clears throat> okay, so what guides the assembly of gut microbes across host taxa? There's a lot of answers to this question, uh, and I think you guys are well aware of this. Diet microbe interactions can influence whether one species has a certain microbiome versus another. And that's been shown in Drosophila melanogaster. Just within one Drosophila, Sharon et al. split that uh, species onto two different media. And we're able to show that these two different media confer different gut microbiomes, which in turn reduce mating between the two different Drosophila strains. And of course, this is a common phenomenon in many other examples. And then Rawls et al. early on showed that there's likely a host by microbiome interaction, right? If you take the microbiome of mice and you take the microbiome of fish and you put them into germ-free raised mice and fish, um, essentially a transplant of one species microbiota to another, well, they don't just make do with what they received. The host, um, this may be too forceful, but the host will work with that microbiota to reshape its, uh, its phenotype or its composition to look something more like the original conventional microbiota. The same thing for the fish. Now, it could also be that the microbes are doing a little bit of choosing themselves. Once they're put into a foreign gut, certain microbes may do better in those environments. and That's why we see these shifts. But in this case, there appears to be some kind of intrinsic host by microbe interaction. And when we study symbiosis, we're really interested in those intrinsic-like interactions, or what we call intergenomic interactions between hosts and microbes. And one of the only ways we can really get at that, at least that we've reasoned, is we've got to do laboratory controlled studies where we eliminate the confounding variables of diet, uh, environment, uh, age, gender, all things that are known to make differences in a host microbiome. And if we do that, we can isolate potentially the host genetic background effect on the assembly of the microbiome. So let's start with Hubble's neutral theory of, of assembly for a host situation. In this case, there's an equal opportunity for all microbes to colonize. So there will be no relationship between microbiome similarity and nuclear genetic similarity of the host. Under a possible predictive mechanism in which a host background influences the microbiome assembly, you might expect a deterministic assembly where there's a positive correlation between the microbes that assemble in a particular host species. And if that's true, we should test that by looking for parallel patterns of changes in the nuclear genome in the gut microbiome. And we call this phylosymbiosis for lack of a better word, because what we're looking at is community-wide changes in parallel with nuclear phylogeny. This is not coevolution. Let's be clear about that. This is just 
parallel changes. So we reason that phylogenomics is the analogy for phylosymbiosis. Looking at multiple symbionts, looking at multiple genes gets us to this term. All right. So in Nisonia, at least in this pupil stage, uh, the microbiota localizes to the hindgut. Uh, the microbiota is largely dominated by gamma proteobacteria, uh, which is very common in insects. So Drosophila, bees also have lots of gamma proteobacteria, and this is different from mammals typically. So even at this gross invertebrate vertebrate level, there's some host specificity of what microbes assemble and what types of host. Um, the microbiota is developmentally staged, so there's microbial successions happening over time. So with the larvae, we have a very simple microbial community with the number of OTUs uh, shown uh, in ends. In the pupa, it increases. In the adult, it even increases more. So there's a blossoming of microbial diversity uh, over development. And what was interesting to us is that when you look at each developmental stage, you see phylosymbiosis of these different microbial communities each developmental stage. So the pupae have a different set of microbes than the adults, but they each respectively show phylosymbiosis. So remember, here's the nuclear phylogeny of Nisonia, and that parallels the dendrogram relationships for the microbiota. <clears throat> also, you know, just finding phylosymbiosis doesn't necessarily tell us anything about function. It's important to now look at whether this, these changes in parallel are neutral changes or adaptive changes. So what we're doing now is we're moving microbes from one species into the other and vice versa and assaying fitness to see if there's any particular effect of each species microbiota. Um, and the short answer is yes, there's an effect. Uh, so phylosymbiosis is predicting that there is a functional difference and we can confirm it. This is an experiment where we looked at larval size in germ-free rearing. Um, and we inoculated uh, germ-free larvae with either an autologous microbiota from the same species or a heterologous microbiota from a different species. And what's clear is that over development, larval size is increasing, but it increases faster for the autologous microbiota than the heterologous microbiota. And this is a common phenomenon where development is slowed in germ-free or in transbiotic organisms. We also see that now in Nisonia through this through this kind of assay. There's also potentially some functions related to the origin of species. And so when we initially observed uh, this co-pattern, we were also intrigued by the fact that when you make F2 hybrids, in the absence of Wolbachia, you can now interbreed these organisms. And the F2 hybrids now experience severe hybrid inviability in which the larvae melanize. And insects secrete melanin to encapsulate pathogens. So it was as if there was a hyperimmune response uh, in these hybrid larvae that essentially leads to their death. So given phylosymbiosis and given what looks like a genome by microbiome breakdown, it certainly seemed like a good idea to go after what are the microbes in the hybrids and are they causal to the speciation event or this reproductive isolation event. So this data here just shows us the amount of mortality. Uh, there's about 80 to 90 percent larval mortality in the hybrids relative to the non-hybrids. All right, the unusual thing is uh, the folks in the Nasonia field for the last decade have been studying this reproductive isolation trait as a genetically determined trait. So what's the genetic basis? Well, if you look at five chromosomes of Nasonia, you can map the QTL regions for hybrid inviability to at least these four regions. And that has been the state of the art and is very consistent with trying to find the speciation genes on these chromosomes, as many evolutionary biologists do in their respective systems. But we can also ask, what's the microbial basis? Something that's rarely done in the field, but may be needed in a more common way, because in this case, we were able to show that the normal larvae of Duralti and Vitropenis, their microbiota looks very different from what we see in the inviable hybrid. And in fact, these microbiotas were measured just before larval death. So this isn't a a result of the death, it's actually an altered microbiota just before death, which may facilitate the death rather than be an after effect. So given that we were observing a difference rather than the microbiota being the same between parents, we reason that perhaps there's a breakdown in the genome by microbiome interactions. And the basic ways to go after testing that are 
the following. Uh, conventionally reared hybrid will die, but if we germ-free rear that hybrid, we can rescue it, uh, even though it's genetically based. If we remove the microbes, which are part of the story, we can rescue the viability, and then we can put the microbes back into the germ-free hybrid and reinstate the mortality. That's at least the prediction, and I would argue that doing speciation studies on hybrid and viability or sterility probably necessitates this kind of approach for all systems, because if we never do these types of experiments, we'll never see the microbial role of hybrid uh, in viability or sterility, and maybe pre-mating isolation as well. So here's the conventional story again. The hybrid genotypes in the middle, 80 to 90 percent death relative to the parents. When we germ-free rear them, the eureka moment was the viability largely came back. Uh, even though these genotypes had been genetically mapped for QTLs, they were essentially living uh, fine hybrids at this point. And we could put certain types of microbes back into the hybrids and reinstate a portion of the mortality that's seen here in the conventional state. All right. So what about these QTLs that have been mapped to chromosomes? Uh, what's their story in all this? Because we've got two separate things now. We've got QTL regions and we've got microbes. How do we put that story together? And it simply, it goes like this. That under germ-free rearing, we predicted that if these QTLs are causal in the mortality, they should no longer be QTLs under germ-free rearing because we're rescuing the hybrid and viability. So here's the way we make F2 recombinant hybrids in Nisonia. We derive them from F1 females who are just recombinant genotypes from the heterozygous genomes of the vitropenis and Geralti, mother and father. When we see mortality and determine QTLs, we determine it by a uh, deviation from Mendelian ratios. So if we take markers from any of these chromosomes that are in the QTL regions, you'll notice that they're not 50-50. Uh, ratios. They're biased towards one direction or the other. That indicates that the hybrid and viability is associated with some of the biases seen in these markers. However, when we germ-free rear these organisms, they all return to Mendelian-like ratios. So the QTLs for the genetics are no longer QTLs. So you can understand mapping uh, speciation genes to the chromosomes, in this case, without understanding that the microbes are facilitating those QTLs to be QTLs, right? It takes two to tango. So in that regard, we're now also interested in looking at what's the host genetic side of this problem. And we've measured the immune gene expression of uh, conventional and inoculated hybrids relative to germ-free hybrids. Because we reason that the immune system is a good candidate for causing uh, the genome by microbiome interactions. So the immune expression is increased relative to the genome in the cases where we see the dead hybrids, and it's underexpressed in the cases where we see the germ-free hybrids living. And if you zoom in closer on this data, which is, this is just a microarray data of all the immune genes, a few candidates pop out. <clears throat> uh, the ones in blue are SPs, and their expression variation, inoculated or conventional expression over germ-free, is extremely high. And the CSPs are serine proteases. And what's interesting to us, if we're going to make a leap in logic here, is that serine proteases sit at the top of the signaling cascade that launches melanin production. And melanization is the phenotype we most grossly see in the hybrid and viability. So what we're going to do is we're going to knock down the serine proteases. And in theory, we should be able to rescue in viability even when those hybrids have an altered microbiota. Just like we did with the microbiome, we can knock it down and rescue in viability. We should be able to do the same thing with the genome. So it takes two to tango, uh, and we're try currently trying to pursue that in the lab. <clears throat> so on the origin of species, we have, at least in Nisonia, an F1 case and an F2 case. Different sets of microbes are all causing severe cases of mortality. And it's interesting for me to ask, you know, are we just getting lucky with Nisonia that we see these uh, speciation by symbiosis traits, or is it actually a more common phenomenon? And all that it takes is for investigators to look at the microbial side when they're studying the origin of species. And I would suggest it's the latter. 
I don't think we've just gotten extremely lucky by studying this zone. So I want to wrap up with some new data on how universal is phyllosymbiosis. Because we observe it in the Sonia, and if it's not common elsewhere, um, who cares then? It's just Nasonia. Nobody cares about Nasonia. So it has been observed in other organisms, though. So hydra have a really good case of phyllosymbiosis, where the microbial community's uh, dendrogram parallels the phylogeny of the host. A beautiful paper published by Tom Bosch and Sebastian Fraschen's group uh, in PNAS. It's also been observed uh, to some degree through some of the original publications on host by microbe interactions. So this is a study done by Jeff Gordon's lab, led by Ruth Lay, and they were looking at 60 different mammalian species, many of which were collected from the zoo, and they, <clears throat> through network analysis, were able to show that the, the things that have an effect on the gut microbiota assembly in these species are both diet and phylogeny or host genetics. In contrast, a randomized association would look like this. So these two factors have an effect on the assembly of the microbiota. But this is sort of the catch-22 when you do wild studies or field studies, is you can't disentangle diet from host genetics. So we really don't know if this variation is driven more by one versus the other, and what's the role of intergenomic interactions. So we're now moving into controlled laboratory studies of animal systems from invertebrates to vertebrates, where we do the controls, and we look at a number of different taxa spanning um, pretty significant ranges of divergence times for those taxa. And we're not the first ones to look in these systems, but we are the first ones to do it under a controlled uh, design. So recently, uh, Pat Schloss's group looked at paramiscus field populations from two subspecies. There was really no evidence of phylosymbiosis. Uh, Drosophila has been a well-studied system, both in the lab and in the field, and there's really no evidence for phylosymbiosis. Uh, we've done this, obviously, in the Sonia, and we found it. <clears throat> I think if you go into, into the field, you have a lot of confounding issues. You obviously have the effects of diet and geography and age and gender and so forth. And in some of the Drosophila studies, they suffer from the same problems. Even laboratory studies didn't control for gender. So there may be reasons why they're not observing this. Okay, so to, to test phylosymbiosis, we're adding two statistics in, the Mantell test and the Anasim test. Oops. So the Mantell test is a statistical test of the significance of the correlation between distance matrices. Um, so we're looking at the distance matrices for the phylogeny in the host dendrogram and how good do they parallel each other. And then the Anasim test is a statistical test for how well um, species microbial communities cluster together when we sample multiple individuals from those particular species. So how unique are each species microbiota? Okay, so here's deer mice and mosquitoes. Uh, we do see perfect phylosymbiosis in both these cases. Uh, what's interesting to point out is probably the biology here. The range of divergence times are quite different. Seven million years, six taxa, 108 million years, eight taxa, and yet we still see phylosymbiosis. This actually surprised us because we thought there might be a Goldilocks zone where if you're too divergent, you won't see phylosymbiosis, and if you're too closely related, you won't see it. But in this case, we're actually seeing it at some distances that surprised us. Uh, Mantel test was significant with pretty good correlations between the distance matrices. <clears throat> and then as far as the NSM test goes, if you look at the um, mosquito data, first of all, if you do intergroup comparisons of all replicates within groups to each other, you have a significantly lower distance in the microbial communities than if you do between groups, which is what you'd expect. And then the anasim basically tells us how well do species microbial communities cluster uh, from replicate individuals in the same colors, and that is quite strong for the mosquito data set. In Drosophila and Nasonia, we also see phylosymbiosis. However, we do see a deviation in two species in Drosophila. And I have to say, we were surprised to see any phylosymbiotic pattern in Drosophila, given the previous reports that there was no evidence of this. Um, but I think controlling for the factors that we are taking into account excavates that phylosymbiotic signal that is otherwise missed. So this tells us that there are genome by microbiome interactions 
even when you control for all these other extrinsic variables. OK, then as sort of a fun thing, even though this isn't a controlled experiment because we can't put all these animals on the same diet, we took the metadata and just made a giant dendrogram tree of it. And uh, what we see is that there's vast divergences in the microbiotas. But of significance is that uh, the paramiscus deer mice more closely resemble the hominid data set uh, from this particular publication than the insect data sets. Uh, so at a gross level, there's some sorting of the variation between vertebrates and invertebrates as well. Okay, so do microbes drive the origin of many species? I'll just leave with a few philosophical points here. Um, the short answer is there are rising numbers of cases. And I talked to you about the gut bacteria in Drosophila melanogaster that change on different media and that facilitate pre-mating isolation. There are also other cases of Wolbachia in Drosophila. There are many cases where insects will simply not exist on their food sources. For example, aphids on plant sap, which is deficient in essential amino acids. They just can't exist without their nutritional symbionts, Buchnera, that confer the missing essential amino acids. So the origin of all aphids is in fact attributable to their symbionts, and perhaps the radiation across different host plants is attributable to their symbionts. Plants are uh, part of the story as well. So if you look at hybrid incompatibilities between strains of Arabidopsis, what Kirsten Bombley's lab showed early on was you see these deformed small F1 hybrids between varieties of Arabidopsis. And she was able to map these two immune genes in the plant genome. Immune genes are important. There's some kind of large immune effect on speciation. So even in many types of animals, chimps, Drosophila, and humans in this case, immune genes end up being some of the most common genes under positive selection and rapid evolution. Immune genes are the windows into symbiosis. If a speciation geneticist or an evolutionary geneticist maps interesting evolutionary or speciation traits to an immune gene, they're mapping most likely a symbiotic speciation or divergence event. They just haven't considered the other side of the equation. I think that's the big task that we have to holistically come together on to get a more synergistic interaction between microbiologists botanist and zoologist in Darwin's uh, species problem. So I'll just summarize. We're coming out from Darwin. We've gone through several stages of history, uh, tensions between fields. But arguably, we're in an interesting era where some of this is starting to come together. Um, you could summarize a few other epochs in biology. You know, Darwin's, was, Darwin's theory was eukaryocentric. The modern synthesis was nucleocentric. Then we have the revelation from Woese and Margulis and many others on the universality of microbes and symbiosis. And this is all coming together for the next generation, really for the young scientists here, to drive the postmodern synthesis. And so it might be fun for the young investigators to think about the time that you're doing work in right now. Because arguably, it's akin to the time that genetics got started 100 years ago. And very basic questions were being asked about how do nuclear genes link to fundamental biological processes. And you're doing research now at a time when microbes are being asked of the same thing. <clears throat> and we're in the first 10 years. So there will probably be another 100 years of great biology, just like genetics has had 100 years to bring us to the point where we are right now. OK, so I will thank the following uh, folks who contributed to this work. A lot of it was led by Rob Brucker, who's now a junior fellow at the Rollin Institute at Harvard. Uh, several personnel in the lab, Lisa, Andy, and Teddy are graduate students. Rini was a bioinformatician. Uh, and the Dimensions of Biodiversity program for getting this work started. So thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> and I made it. I didn't lose the voice completely. Yeah, go for it. <clears throat> yeah, up top. Yes, sorry. Thank you for a really interesting talk. I have two questions. Sure. Um, the first one is, do you think that the difference... Hello? <laughs> do you think that the differences in um, 
the phylosymbiosis that you see um, are due to the changes in the membership of the closely related species or are due to changes in the relative contributions of the bacterial symbionts that you see in those species' guts. Yeah. And then my second question is about um, whether or not you think that your conclusions might vary a little bit if you follow the same organisms over their lifespan or over just adding the time series component, mm. because we know that a lot of gut microbiota have quite variability over time, especially in humans. And so I just wondered about your comments on that. Thanks. Yeah. So the first answer is probably too short for satisfaction, but the answer is yes, both factors are changing across biosymbiosis. Um, so both abundance and taxonomic composition. And you'll note that the microbiota dendrograms have very deep divergence times, whereas sometimes the host species don't. Uh, so it looks like the microbiota is changing more rapidly than at least the genes we constructed the phylogenies with. That's probably not a shocking thing, but that divergence is coming from both taxonomic as well as abundance changes. Um, in terms of your last question, the sort of what happens over an organism's lifetime, I think that there's an area of variability here that's really hard to grasp, which is what you're asking me to sort of try and tackle is, how do you now incorporate the fact that when you don't necessarily look at one stage of development or one time period, what happens? And boy, I would like to know. But the short answer is I'm going to start where at least we can control things and have a good idea of how we can conclude. Um, if we start looking at, let's say, does an older male become incompatible with a younger female because of the gut microbes or not, those are definitely doable experiments. I just don't have a sense of how to answer that yet. Um, and in some cases, you know, it's not necessarily relevant in the sense that microbes are coming in all the time. So a lot of those microbes are going to be neutral. Um, they're just coming and going because they're breathing in air that has different microbes or they're aging so they have a different immune system. But it may not be functionally relevant microbes. And so the, probably the critical question is, is you know, what's functionally relevant at these different stages when we start to look at these functional questions? Um, I don't know if that's satisfactory, but I'd love to hear more thoughts on it. Do you just want to try and shout? Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, also related to the same part of the topic of biosymbiosis. Sure. So how do you differentiate that pattern from the case where the host would end up having to deal with the microbiome, but then the microbiome is just simply stuck at that? Yeah. <clears throat> so, well, the assumption that I didn't say is that we're assuming the microbiome is largely environmentally acquired. So it can't track, the microbes can't track without some kind of environmental acquisition under that model. The microbes could track if they're vertically transmitted. But currently, I think we have to take the position that most of the microbiome is not vertically transmitted. So then you end up with really the Hubble's neutral theory as the default explanation for what's going to happen in assembly over host ancestry. And it should not parallel host ancestry unless there's some kind of microbiome genome interaction. Does that make sense? Yeah, so there, there has to be, because tracking doesn't work if the microbiome is environmentally acquired. Because we're starting from a position of everything's out there, the host is out there, the microbes are out there separately. Now they come together, but how they come together and what relationship is important. And that can't happen by vertical transmission or tracking per se. Yeah, so the, so, so in this case, is the transmission caused by a system that is incompatibility between genome and a microbiome or between the two microbiomes? Ah, I see. That's an interesting question. Well, here's what we know. Um, yes, the hybrid microbiota is different. How it's different is not, is, I haven't said that. So a rear microbe in the parents becomes more dominant in the hybrids. That's one major change. There's also acquisition of new rear microbes in the hybrids that aren't in the parents. So it's both abundance changes and taxonomic changes. Now, is the incompatibility due to microbe microbe interactions or microbe genome interactions? We can answer that actually because we, in our inoculation experiments, we're only putting in 
in some cases, one microbe into the hybrid, germ-free hybrids, and that elicits the mortality. So in that case, it can't be a micro-microbe interaction. Plus, the QTLs are mapping, so we know that there are some effects of the nuclear genome on the mortality. Is that satisfying? Right here, maybe? Or, sorry, go ahead. Um, so I have like the, the field population data where I have three species of salamanders that I sampled that are about 10 million years in divergence, <coughs> and they all pretty much look the same. So they are like one of the, the field examples. So what I'm trying to think about is y whenever you bring those animals into the lab, the microbial community shifts to some degree. It still kind of mimics the natural population, but is it that there's something about the environmental influence in the field that you can't really control for that maybe is slowing the process of speciation mm. or is just, I, I don't know, I, yeah. if there's like any kind of comments of what like a natural community is really doing and how you can't really uncover that pattern as well when they're in the field as whenever they're in the lab. That's a really interesting point about slowing speciation. Um, so I've largely avoided field studies because I can't understand Right. There's so much variation, um, which is why we start in the lab. And we think that once we start in the lab, we'll have a good baseline to go back out into the field and compare what we know in the lab to what's in the field. Part of my feeling is, it's a gut feeling, is the, what we see in the lab is probably a microcosm of what's in the field because the field generally has a lot more variability. A lot of it's probably neutral. And so we're trying to construct m whole microbial community dendrograms and relationships on whole communities and microbes in the field, lots of which just may be neutral. Whereas we isolate a lot of that neutral variability when we bring them into the lab. So one thing we could do is look for the essential fat microbes in the lab. Do they persist in the field? And it may be that only a small fraction of the microbes in the field constitute phyllosymbiosis, whereas everything else isn't. But when we lump it together in these gross analyses, we're going to see no effect or a lot of similarity between species. And so, this is the conundrum uh, of biocomplexity that we're in, and it's really you know, up to us to figure this out over the long term about how to not just have such simplistic measurements of whole communities, but to portion microbial components away from each other to get at these questions. Yeah, great. Uh, so I think generally the evolutionary biologists in the Drosophila field in particular are at a point where <clears throat> they think that because they've mapped genes to nuclear chromosomes that speciation can't be commonly caused by symbionts. And the failure in that argument that they don't realize is that just because they're mapping something to a nuclear chromosome, it could be an immune gene for all we know, and that immune gene's interacting with a symbiont just like we've seen in the Masonia cases. So I think they're taking, they're, they're, they're still stuck in this modern sense of thinking of all the change has to happen in the nucleus. Yes, a lot of it does, but it's interacting with the microbiome and that opens the door. The other thing is, is they'll say the general rules of speciation are explained by nuclear genetics. So Haldane's rule, which is where um, when one sex is sterile or viable, it's typically the heterogametic sex the XY male, for example, and that maps to usually a sex chromosome for that particular reason. But again, I think that it's, it's an assumption that they're making that because Haldane's rule perhaps appears to be a sex chromosome-based phenomena, that symbionts can't explain that. And that's simply not true. We, have, we do actually have cases where microbes explain Haldane's rule. So the absence of evidence is driving, I think, their criticism at least their lack of knowledge in this area is driving their criticism. And it's part of my mission to sort of wake up the field and say, no, there's more to it. And it's not just going to be one person that can do that. It's going to take a lot of people to, to change a field, if it's changeable at all. Um, so yeah, th that's kind of where we are. And uh, the, I guess to wrap this up, the microbiological community sort of often sees this as obvious, which is, which is you know, a delight. But it's but we do have our challenges. Yeah. <clears throat>
assessed by both the men and where the crime scene on Fifth Avenue has been located at Fifth Street and Main Street in a graphical sense nestling at the border of the Dixon Crossings and the Gore Crossings. Right. Yeah. Actually, I don't disagree with you. Um, so the semantics is probably what might, we might get caught up in. Um, these are genome by genome interactions. Right? So the genome by genome interactions are the internal in the microbe case or external in your plant insect case. So I, the, fundamentally, they are the same. Uh, what's different is that biology has had a long history of appreciating the extrinsic ecological interactions. We have rarely looked internally to think about these questions. And so that's what's different, just the content of the biology, but the principles apply. I, I like to think that uh, John Thompson's geographic mosaic of coevolution will scale into the microbiome at some point, G by G by E interactions. Um, and we, we just don't have the complex systems theory yet to really get a hold on the complexity here, because it's far greater than it is extrinsically when you're looking at the microbiome. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, there's sort of an intellectual continuum here. Uh, cultural evolution is no different than gene-gene evolution in a genome. All we care about are whether associations are strong enough for selection to operate on them. So we're just extending that to gene by microbe associations, but all this is part of the same continuum. Yeah, good point. Yes, we are, and yes, we have done that. So all Nasonia in the wild uh, harbor these different Wolbachia infections. Um, and so what that means is all three species of Nasonia have different Wolbachia infections. They're universal in the field. And so what we're observing in the lab is highly relevant to what we see in field conditions. Yeah. And we're using single gene markers in this case. We're not analyzing all genomes, but we're able to type these strains with these single gene markers. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it.